The water crisis, time to turn the tide. Please welcome our moderator, host of CNBC, Brian Sullivan. Hi, everybody. I, I just learned from one of the actors on the panel that this is where the Golden Globes are held. So that's kind of cool, right? So, so welcome to our version of the Golden Globes, which is the Milken way of solving problems. And that's what's cool about the Milken Conference, right? It's not just about talk, it's about solutions, finding answers, um, and having some interesting ways to do that. And, and welcome, everybody. We got a full house. This is terrific because this is a big deal issue. And some of the stuff that, that I have learned in preparing for the panel has been truly eye-opening. A lot of it is maddening. A lot of it is saddening. Uh, but we got a lot of smart people in this room and on this panel that are going to hopefully help us solve some of these problems tonight. So without further ado, uh, find a seat if you haven't. Let's get going. I'm going to introduce our panel from the left to the right here. To my far left is Gary White. He's the CEO, and he is the co-founder of Water.org. Gary, welcome. Thank you. Uh, to my direct left is Usha Rao Manari, CEO of Global Water Development Partners, part of the Blackstone Group. Really going to focus on the infrastructure and investment side of the issue. Your IMF, World Bank, you're connected to that global money, yes. Usha, which is good. Um, to my right here is Matt Damon. Uh, he turned down a number of jobs, even with a high intellect in Boston one time, uh, to chase a girl out west. Um, and it's, it's, it's worked out for him. So he is obviously the co-founder as well of water.org. And, and really, he's not, what's been amazing to me is, you know, a lot of these issues, you sort of get the celebrities that, that are there. Um, in our planning sessions, uh, the guy knows his stuff. You could tell he's very, very passionate about this issue and it means a lot to him. Uh, and to my far right here is Mahmoud Khan, Executive VP, Chief Scientific Officer, Global R&D at Pepsi, uh, which not only is doing a lot to help solve the problem, but also needs to do a lot because it's important to them. And he'll talk about how this is not just philanthropy. This is actually good business as well. We've got a great introductory video. However, before we roll the video, um, there was a private session prior to this. Um, Stephen, you better pick your head up, because uh, Matt's got an announcement here. To make. Yeah, we just wanted to say quickly uh, um, and announce publicly, we got a million dollar commitment <clears throat> to water.org from Stephen Klebeck. <laughs> so thank you. You'll, you'll hear more tonight about where that money will go and what, and what we do, um, but, uh, but we owe a big thank you to you, Stephen. And in the meantime, do I hear a million one? <laughs> <laughs> Matt, was that you? No, it's all right. So um, before we begin, uh, we got an awesome video. Let's roll the video here. Set the stage nicely. If you don't know about the water crisis, you should. 2.6 billion people are affected. They lack clean water and a toilet. Each day, kids miss school. Moms walk miles. Families get sick from unsafe water and too many die. Over 4,000 kids every day. For those days we felt like a mistake. We all know this is wrong, it's tragic, and it's totally unnecessary because it's solvable, if done right and with urgency. At water.org, we are dedicated to solving the global water crisis. Our more than 25 years of experience has given us insight we know the water crisis can't be solved by a one-size-fits-all approach. We know it's not just about drilling wells, and that charity alone won't ever solve the challenge. To us, people in poverty are citizens and customers with rights and economic power, not just people in need of a handout. They want to determine their own future. Our role is to make this happen. So we go to communities who ask for help. With our local partners, we tailor programs to meet their needs. We engage innovative supporters. We bring in new sources of capital. Our solutions are built to last and must extend to other places quickly. And we develop game-changing ideas. One idea we pioneered is water credit. Water credit is a small loan for a family or community to get a water connection or a toilet. We convinced banks to make loans that weren't being made by sharing the financial risk with them. This brought new funds to people in need. And guess what? The idea works. And as the loans are being paid back, 
the money is recycled to others in need. Water credit is taking off around the world because it benefits more people faster. That makes it a solution critical to ending the crisis. Look, we have to be bold to solve the water crisis. Ensuring that everyone has safe drinking water and the dignity of a toilet is one of humanity's most urgent problems. The water crisis is complex, and we understand it. Let us work on your behalf, proudly. At water.org, we're dedicated to solving the water crisis in our lifetime. You can help make this happen. Join us. All right, let, let's start off with a couple of big numbers and then one, one small number, which is this. I mean, you may have said it, 4,000 kids a day, well, you know, over a million a year, a couple hundred thousand preventable diseases. By 2030, three billion people will face either water scarcity or clean water scarcity. These are huge numbers, but let's talk about a small one. What's the cost of a well? Well, that's a really good question. Um, typically, the cost of, of a well, you can get uh, clean water to somebody for uh, $25 per person for life. But, um, but the water credit model that I was talking about in that video, um, <clears throat> and, and I guess we'll get in depth with it later, but, but we, we, we've been able to drive, and our most mature loan programs, to drive that cost down to between 6 and $7 uh, in cost in philanthropic capital per person. Is that because the scale's up? Is that because exactly, how yeah. it's paid back? Exactly, yeah. You got, a, you got a lot of startup costs going in. Basically, the idea, I'll, I'll give you the, 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 the fast version here. The idea is in these urban and peri-urban communities, oftentimes you have an, a municipality and they're, they're pumping water you know, right under the feet of all of the people who are living in these slums. But those people aren't connected to that infrastructure. Um, and so Gary, my partner, pioneered this idea years ago um, with a lot, uh, our first, uh, one of our first major donors was the PepsiCo Foundation, actually. They kind of bought in when this idea was in its nascent stage. But what the idea was, uh, Gary, with all of his years of expertise in this, in, in, in living in, in, in these areas, realized that people were paying, these poor people were paying for their water. Um, they were paying more for their water than the middle class or for the tourists staying in the hotels. Um, and. And the problem for them was that they couldn't connect to the infrastructure that was, uh, that was there. And if, if you, it, he basically took these concepts of microfinance that Muhammad Yunus was using and just repurposed them and applied them to, to water. Um, at first, there was a little pushback because people thought, well, that's not an income generating loan. You know, the classic microfinance loan is somebody goes, takes a loan and says, I'm, I'm, I'm buying a sewing machine, and with that money, I'm going to make these clothes, and that's how I'm going to pay the loan back, and they get the loan. With this, these people were, were working in these communities, may, maybe doing menial labor, ho housekeepers, it, that, that type of thing, and, and, and they were taking time away from their jobs to go collect water in a community spot and sit and wait and wait their turn, and it was incredibly unproductive. And so our theory was that if you could float them the loan to connect to the existing infrastructure, you would buy their time back. And so it's not an income generating loan, but it is an income enhancing, enhancing loan. And, and the theory was that these loans would pay back once these people <clears throat> had more hours to, to work at their jobs rather than fritter their time away in, 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 a, in a line. And so at this point, we, we've completed over 300,000 of these loans. Um, we've reached over a million and a half people, and the loans pay back, uh, the completed loans have paid back at over 98%. Um, so it's been a big success. And, and, and who am I to correct that? But, you, but, you, but, but I think you're wrong. It's not just, it's, it, it is, let's, let's just fight all night. Um, <laughs> it is an income generating loan because Gary, and, and actually Matt, you brought this point up in our, in our planning really? session, which is there are children who are not able to learn to read. Right. Because, they, because their job for the family mm -hmm. is, to, is to get water. Mm -hmm. And if, if they can't read, we understand their economic prospects are dim. So in a way, you are generating a, probably a great deal of positive GDP growth. Yeah, and, and it's income enhancing, and it's, it's allowing people to get that first hand on the, this ladder uh, of economic growth, right, to pull themselves up out of poverty. Water is oftentimes that first rung on the ladder. And I think when you, when you look at how you can take this philanthropic capital 
like from the PepsiCo Foundation and the Caterpillar Foundation and MasterCard and others that have invested in the early stage of this and leveraged that into commercial capital. It's pretty powerful. So about $9 million that's been invested so far in that philanthropic capital has leveraged $60 million in commercial capital that's now funding these loan portfolios. That's $60 million that doesn't have to be raised through charity. And those loan portfolios in turn then filter down to people living in poverty to get these loans, to get these connections. I think a, a good example that, that paints a picture of this is when Matt and I were in, uh, in, in Bangalore just last summer. The woman that I met there was paying 20 rupees a day for her family of five to get access to water from these private water vendors that come around and sell it in these jerry cans of dubious quality. Uh, she was paying 20 rupees a day for her family of five to go use the public toilet. So about 1,200 rupees a month for this informal system uh, that she was paying, about $20. So she took out a loan to get a water connection right in her home from one of our local partners. She took out a loan to build a toilet right there. Her monthly payments to repay that loan for the next two years are $1,200 a month. Rupees. I'm sorry, y'all, sorry. Yeah, if it was dollars, that would be a very bad economic decision by the poor lady in Bangkok. No, I just want sorry. to point that out. Thank right? you. I wanted rupees. That's the brains of the operation. <laughs> uh, so it's uh, 1,200 rupees every month. So it equals what she's paying. So after two years, she'll be free and clear. It's that whole concept of that the poor have little amounts of money to invest in their needs today, but they can't invest for the future. And basically, by us nudging microfinance yeah. into the space, they can then tap into that power that they can have. And it's interesting, the point too, and Usha, I'm gonna to come to you in a second, but what you're basically saying is this poor woman was being shaken down. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Exactly. For money. Exactly. I mean, for water. For, for everything for a basic she had, yes. Human need. That's right. So so you know, Usha, okay, you, you, you think on a big scale, right? So IMF World Bank, you're tapped into the DC sort of flow there. Why has this issue not gotten more attention on a global scale? You're trying to help. Mahmood Pepsi's trying to help. These guys are trying. But why are we not hearing more about this? Because in my view, water has not been connected to economic growth. Water is not yet, even today, considered a fundamental input into economic development. And the data is like power is considered an input into economic development. So is transportation and other types of infrastructure. As soon as water is also considered something that is sure for survival, but also for the economic growth and development of countries and for the prosperity of those countries, then there will be much more movement. But it's not, Brian, it's not as if there's no movement. I love what water.org is doing. I think there are more, I wish there were 100 million more water.orgs to raise the awareness of the issue. My worry from where I sit is scale. How do we scale up all these efforts that many, many people are making? And I'm going to stop in a second, but I think there's three things you have to consider when it comes to scale. There's the issue of finance, whether it's microfinance type of uh, financing or much larger scale financing. Finance has to be part of the equation. For me, there's the issue of innovation, whether it's business model or technology mm. in the delivery of water. Mm -hmm. You have to worry about how to bring that into the picture. And finally, there's governance, regulation, prices, tariffs, God knows. This was my life when I was at the IFC and the World Bank. And I think you have to put all those three to, uh, elements together to scale up access and just scale up attention on the water sector. Well, while people are fighting over rules and regulations, people are also going thirsty and don't have clean drinking water and sanitation. Y yes. Uh, y you know, Mahmoud, it's interesting, though, because we know water is, from what I understand, necessary for human life. <laughs> That's pretty which, which makes it relatively... You've done your reading. I really have. <laughs> I'm impressed. I studied up, man. I studied up. Um, but, you know, from a, from a corporate perspective, if Pepsi doesn't have water, you're out of business. So, so there's also a profit motive. There's a, so combine the idea of good PR, you're doing good work, you're doing philanthropic work with. Pepsi has to have this. Tell us why you need to have this. Well, there's several, several things, and we've approached this coming at it, Usha, is exactly as Usha is saying. This has to be scalable. It has to be in a cost-effective way. But we've seen this systematically. We've looked at this not only as philanthropic support through our foundation. And in fact, a single largest recipient from our foundation is actually water.org. That's how much we believed in you guys right from the start and continue to. And, but also bringing to it technical expertise. We know a lot about water processing, distribution, and then taking that learning and bringing it back. 
How do we reduce our water use in our operations? How do we reduce our water use in our agricultural and all of our produce production? But it's the bottom line that's impact. This is a true win-win. If we look at 2011, which is the last time we audited relative to 2006 over that five-year period, our cost of water and energy reduction as a result of all these initiatives went down by $45 million. Mm -hmm. That's $45 million down to the bottom line. So this isn't just charity, it's good business. Mm -hmm. And in the long term, we, like any corporation, have a license to do business in the communities we do business in. And in order to have that license, we have to build sustainable operations that allow us to continue to do business in those. So absolutely, it's long-term strategic benefit, it's short-term profit benefit, and at the end of the day, it's also good for the people we serve. It's a win-win. No, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Well, and, and I think weaving that all together, and you guys have underpinned it with this fundamental commitment to access to water as a human right. That's a pretty bold statement, and, and other corporations have followed along those same lines, but I think that whole social license to operate can't just stop at the gates of the factory. It has to extend out into the community, and you guys have lived that with this commitment to reach six million people with water access. So it, it fits together with the complete business model, I think, in PepsiCo's case. Yeah, but coming back to the question that you raised on that, if you think about it, what's, you, know, you said, why is there not awareness? We recognized water as a human right at least a year before the United Nations did. Yeah. And we were the first large company to do so, as, as you know. What amazes me is the recognition of water as a human right is a very recent thing even at the UN. Mm -hmm. Up until then, we didn't even consider it as a basic need for humanity. Not sure I'd, not sure I'd compare my efficiency against the UN as a benchmark. <laughs> 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 Just, you're doing good work. Um, where does micro credit, where does the water credit model, Matt, fit, fit into this? We're talking big stuff. So take us again. You've been on the ground. Well, How does it actually work in practice? Well, I, I, think, it's, I think the first step is to, is to change the way we're looking at um, the world's poor. And, and it, it really, it, Gary kind of hit on this in his original thinking about really segmenting the market saying like these 750 million people are not equally poor. They, um, and, and, and they have different capabilities in terms of, uh, you, you know, th there's a huge swath of them at the top of that group that can participate, that, that, that don't need just a straight subsidy and, don't, and, and can participate in controlling their own destiny if you just kind of nudge the market towards them a little bit. And so it was, the th it was a theory that's now been borne out and proven with the success of water credit. Um, and, 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 and this rate of repayment, which is always hovering somewhere between 98 and 99 percent, sometimes goes over 99 percent, but it's just incredibly, uh, uh, it, it, it just works incredibly well. And uh, in fact, it works so well that when we were in India last summer, um, when we kind of polled all of our different MFI partners, the, the one thing that they all said, uh, independent of each other, was, when we asked kind of what the biggest bottleneck was, they said um, access to affordable capital. Like to, to, to a man and woman, they said access to affordable capital. Um, you know, they're taking their wholesale loan at 15%. They mark it up, you know, to keep their lights on. So it's going out at 22 to 24%. So the world's poorest people are taking these loans out at 24%. And that's a good deal compared to the, the, the local loan, sh what the local loan shark will give them. Yeah, you know, and the water people, shark, and these people are being, they're being rooked. They're being rooked. At, at and, every angle, everywhere right, they go. Right, and... Ensuring and, nothing but poverty for the rest of their lives. Exactly, it's kind of keeping them in this cycle of, of, of this death spin of, of, of extreme poverty. And so if you can just, they, they are, they do, they, and they want to be customers, they are, you know, they, we, so it's about tapping into, you know, as we say, tapping into their intrinsic power as customers and citizens. And, 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 and letting them take control of How of aware, we're raising aware, you're raising awareness here. How aware are the people on the ground of your programs? The people on the ground? Anywhere you guys operate, I think it's 17 mm -hmm. different countries, mm -hmm. do, are they aware of water.org in their own way? Do they see wells and, and ask, how do they participate? Do they find you, do you find them? Do you mean local communities? Yes. Or, well, I mean, all how of are these... they identified? How are they selected? Do they come to you? How, how does the process yeah. work? Yeah, well, they have to go through the Gary White vetting mechanism, <laughs> which is uh, severe. Well, I mean, our whole idea <laughs> since we've launched this, and, and this goes back to actually 1990 when there was Water Partners and then we merged with, with Matt's organization, but the whole, the whole cornerstone 
of this has been partnership. And all of that happens through local partners on the ground. And those are the microfinance institutions. So we, when we came to this realization, you know, when we we're knocking around the slums and meeting these women who were paying 125 or 150% interest to loan sharks so they could, what they were basically buying with that was their dignity, right? The, the, the concept of a woman having to wait till nightfall to walk out to the riverbank to defecate, to preserve her dignity, that was something that, that people valued so much they were going to loan sharks and doing this. And so when we saw that, that reality there of, of what was happening, we wanted to respond to that and bring our understanding of water and sanitation into microfinance. So we didn't go out and reinvent the wheel and develop our own microfinance banks. We said, let's see what's out there and already working. And that's where we started to discover and vet and bring on board microfinance partners. Now these guys literally have millions of clients out there already. So they already have a footprint. They're already marketing to these folks with other loan products, like for the sewing machine or the cow or whatever. So all we had to do is, like Matt was saying, we had to nudge them towards water and sanitation. They weren't willing to take the risk because it seemed too risky. We knew the risk and could mitigate it because we understand, understand water. So we said, we'll give you the grant money, the startup capital, to do the market research, to hire the people with the water expertise so you can build them into your microfinance institution. And then, if the market is there, you'll agree to go source the commercial capital. Well, once they came in, they saw a huge demand among their existing clients. So it all spreads by word of mouth, back to your point, how you get the word out among these client bases. And then the microfinance institutions, they'll keep going back to find that capital. Because that, it's unfortunate, but it goes to the model of the, the loan shark that you're saying about the, the water shark, whatever it is, that when you do, unfortunately, with human nature, or when you put reasonably large sums of capital into areas without a lot of controls, there's an opportunity for theft. How do you vet, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that this, this you know, the, like the, the million bucks from Stephen, the generous lo yeah. you know, gift, get used in the right way? I think when you look at it from the bottom up, it's a lot easier to track what's happening. When you start with the problem, the person at being, living in water poverty as the center of the problem and work outward from there, and you can, well, through what we do, work with the microfinance institution, verify that the loan was made, verify that the toilet is in place or the water connection is in place, and then you verify because the money comes back, then you have a pretty tight circle around that capital cycle that's right there. Now, Usha, I know with the World Bank, it's much more challenging, right? Because you're coming at it from a perspective that's top down. And that absolutely has to happen. If we didn't have governments and the World Bank and others investing in this infrastructure that the poor could tap into, then we're kind of lost. So it has to happen in both directions. The challenge is how do you track those capital flows? How do you hold governments more accountable for what's supposed to happen as part of the World Bank plan? How do you ensure that those pipes don't bypass the slums yeah. on the way to the five-star hotels. Right. Those are the things yeah. that we have to do with accountability from the top down. And you could probably speak to this more, Usha, than, than I can. Yeah, the unfortunate thing is that they do bypass mm -hmm. the slums on the way to the five-star hotels. That's the unfortunate thing. I mean, I think I totally agree with you. It's much easier to track capital flows and capital use bottom up. Top down, it's much, much more difficult. And we face this at the World Bank and many of the other development banks in the world. Um, I do want to say something, though, too. One thing is finance, and what I love about the water loan program that you have, water credit program, um, Gary and Matt, is that it's innovative. And it's innovative because it combines microfinance to give people money for water. That's innovative. What I found in my work two decades in water is that the same poor who are benefiting from this kind of innovation are looking for other kinds of innovation, too. They're saying, we want to leapfrog. We don't want the solutions thrown at us that people had in the developed countries or the richer people in my country. So for example, think about the mobile phone. The mobile phone today, all the poor who don't have water have mobile phones, uh, amazingly. So the question is, how do we harness that kind of innovation and put it into the water sector so that people have water like they have mobile phones? It's something to think about. I have a great question for you. Okay. How do you harness that innovation and put it to work in the water sector? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> My thinking is the following. I think that if you, there are, traditionally in the water sector, the, the, the sort of philosophy is that you have to set up these large capital intensive water plants and huge pipe networks to get water to people. 
Today, that has crumbled totally. Even the World Bank has decided that's not the only model in the world. And you have decentralized point of use delivery, mm -hmm. much like what you, you guys are doing through some of the work that you're doing. And so it's all a question of using different delivery models, innovative delivery models, um, to get water to the larger number of people. So the bigger issue is not so much, from my perspective, water, it's sanitation. Mm -hmm. I think, Matt, you mentioned, what was it, two, two and a half, half billion, billion yeah. people Without and that more people dignity. have a cell phone than have a toilet. Uh, yeah, by the and way, to your planet Earth. Worse, I mean, to your point, that's dignity for women. This is this is a question of just dignity and and. And know. well, in some ways, to what Gary you described, you just freedom. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, honestly, freedom, economic freedom, and just right. your and basic human right to, to live well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the next thing that has to be cracked. I mean, we have to figure out how best to do that. Uh, Mahmoud, how does it work for how does it work for Pepsi? Give us, I mean, really take us through the process because here's the reality: when corporations get involved, right, in this kind of project, they will often people say, "Oh, they're just doing it for the PR purpose." What exactly do you get from this, right? Ty, I know that. Pepsi apparently makes products that contain water. We, we understand that. <laughs> so it, it, it is necessary for you. They make water. What's the process? Well, so there are several aspects to where water is used by the food and beverage industry. And remember that 98% of the world's population buys their food from the private sector. So in essence, just about everybody on the planet is touched by our industry. 80% of the world's water use is actually agriculture. Okay? So if you want really the biggest bang for your buck, first of all, figure out how to lower water use by the agricultural sector. By the way, it's also the largest generator of greenhouse gases. So that's where a lot of the focus has to start. Preserving aquifers, reducing irrigation wastage, going to growing rice without flooding paddy fields. If you do all of that, there's going to be a massive impact. The second then is in the processing cycle. To give you an example, all the learnings we've taken and now we've applied, in five years we reduce our water use in our production plants by 16 billion liters a year. Mm -hmm. okay? It didn't just happen by accident. It was very systematic. It was taking learnings from a lot of different areas. But I want to come back to what's happening at the consumer level. Few people really appreciate the connection here until you really point it out. The world's population, first of all, is migrating to cities. In the next 10 to 20 years, 75% of the planet's population is going to live in cities, not in rural areas. Most of those are going to be big mega cities with populations of 10 to 20 million or higher. Okay? How do you provide food, water, distribute it, keep it clean and sanitation in cities where the population density is, if you think LA or New York have high population densities, it's nothing compared to where these cities are. So the infrastructure isn't going to be able to be built fast enough. Migration is happening much faster than infrastructure capacity. So innovation is going to happen technologically. But we get a lot of ideas, and you can imagine as the head of R&D at PepsiCo, every week I get a call, I've got an idea how to fix this. The reality is we've got to do it at a low cost, low energy consumption. You can't create a plasma generator and say, oh, I can purify water. Energy use will go up exponentially. So point of consumption is a very important facet of this. Now, the key is how do you do this? And without getting into the science, there's three things you have to figure out. How do you take out the inorganics, which are the heavy metals? And by the way, the single largest heavy metal poisoning in the history of mankind is happening in the Indian subcontinent as we speak. Why? Because aquifers have been depleted to the point where now we're sucking water out from water levels which are contaminated with cadmium and other heavy metals. Kidney poisoning, neurological disorders. So the, the issues aren't just waterborne diseases in the traditional sense, right. but these others. How do we get rid of microbial toxins, either bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and then organic? All of the fertilizer runoff is ending up in these aquifers too. So if you're going to do this at point of consumption, we have three different types of things to get done at a very low cost. So simply adding a filter re removes the sand and the grit that you can see. It's the stuff you can't see. A lot of in investment has to go into this. If we can figure that out, there's a huge business opportunity. We're, we don't need to ship beverages to the consumer. They can be reconstituted at the point of consumption. Can you imagine what would happen to transportation costs? They'd dramatically come down. So it's a win-win in the long term 
We're in the business of providing beverages, but there's lots of different ways of getting that beverage to Matt consumer. brought up a good point earlier when we were talking, which was that a lot of times the big projects outthink themselves, mm -hmm. right? If you go to some rural area and someone says, I'm going to do some great, oh, forget about this little well, I'm going to put in a big thing and I'm going to mm -hmm. take all this water out. And they put it in and it's expensive, but it looks great and shiny. Mm -hmm. And they leave. You're welcome. Right. <laughs> what happens? <laughs> well, they break. Yeah, they break. <laughs> and nobody in the and village nobody, knows how to fix it. And they don't have the they don't have the right equipment to fix them. They don't have the the uh, expertise to you know to fix them. We've come across a lot of that um, all over the world. Um, you'll see a really beautiful well, a really high tech well that's just sitting there gathering dust. Yep. You know, it had, it's been broken for three or four years, and people are getting sick drinking out of a hand dug well. Um, you know, that half the water projects fail. I think because it, those kind of, those top-down solutions kind of it, on, on the village level really don't work because mm -hmm. they don't get accepted by the community as a, as, as, you know, as, as a real, as a real fix. If you have buy-in at the community level and, and they're participating in the solutions in those, those types of projects can work. Yeah, I think that that's, that, that's oftentimes kind of what a lot of people in the water sector are chasing is the silver bullet device filter treatment system that's going to solve the problem. And technology will play a role. I mean, I, I, I love technology. I have three engineering degrees, so, you know, I, I can get it. But I've discovered that it's that you have to look, getting back to innovation, you have to look for innovation more in the unexpected ways, I think, and dig a little deeper. And, you know, by observing, you know, the financial flows and how that works and the nudges that we're talking about. And then you have to be open to, like, building out from that as you kind of remove one roadblock to the poor getting access to this. How do you go to the next one? And that's the thing that we're doing now with the, the debt fund that we you know, just it's, launched. It's, it's, so. it's, it's interesting because we are, what, 10 miles from the beach, maybe sitting mm -hmm. here, and we talk about how Southern California is going to run out of water in a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. and Vegas. I mean, it's not that far from the largest ocean on the planet. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not saying we're going to run out of salt water. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you're a, see, you've done your research too, Damon. Sorry, Good I couldn't, job. Sorry, couldn't help it. Sorry. It's all right. Um, no, but, but the point I'm trying to make is to take to a small level. Mm -hmm. Do we have a water, because one of the big screaming points on water.org is by 2030, half the world will have a water scarcity problem. Will we have a water scarcity problem or do we have a water access problem because yes we're not drinking the pacific ocean yet <laughs> i know i know but, sorry but, that was a no, cheap shot <laughs> not that bad it's been, i've had much worse believe me but these people the, the water's there yeah yeah no it's, a, it's an access problem exactly yeah. yeah yeah especially depending on where you live i mean it's all all water issues are local at the end of the day right and so there's already people that have not only a, a water access issue they have a crisis i mean 750 million people today kind of wake up not knowing where their water's going to come from that day. That or, day. That 750 day. million. Or they know where it's coming from and it's completely contaminated. And so think about that. I mean, nothing else matters today until you get your first gallon of water. I mean, think how much time, money, effort you would exert today for your first gallon of water, right? It's a crisis for them already. So I think that there are these looming scarcity issues, these macro issues that we need to pay attention to. Uh, to make sure that we're having long-term solutions from the top down. Okay. But the, the poor are showing up with the sipping straw. They don't want to drink through a fire hose. It would take less than one fraction of 1% of all of the freshwater resources available to get water okay. at a basic or, or, level. Or going them. back to my moose you know, point, it would take, you know, 2%, you know, of, of the agriculture, if, if, it, if they could become that more efficient, just 2% would just, would, would completely, t talking about 750 million people in 40 to 50 liter water, liters of water a day, uh, that would completely handle that. So it's not, it's not a scarcity issue. Not impossible. So, right. Yeah. So, well, so how do we, uh, okay, how do we do this then? Because you referenced the pipe of water going from the plant to the five-star hotel, right? Yeah. You know why it does that? Because the five-star hotel wouldn't exist, obviously, but they can make the water move profitably because the five-star hotel customers pays. The people that are in the slum that it's bypassing cannot pay. That's so, not true. Or, that's ironic. That's not, and I, so, go ahead, Matt. So the philosophy right goes. <laughs> so the philosophy no, goes. Exactly. So the, no, you're, that's true. exactly right. right. There's two kinds of scarcity. One is physical scarcity, and there are parts of the world that are absolutely water deficient. Jordan comes to mind as a country like that. 
The other kind of scarcity is economic scarcity. What does that mean? It's, it's, it's to your point. We have the ocean 10 miles from us, and yet we, can't, we don't have water because it costs to desalinate the water. It costs to build a pipe, uh, to bring it to the city, to distribute it to the consumers. And that economic scarcity, for example, is a big deal. If you take the entire African continent, do you know only 4% of the total water resource is harnessed through infrastructure? That's economic scarcity. I mean, they're not, it's not that they don't have water because there is no water. It's because they can't get the water. So whether you call it access <coughs> or you call it economic scarcity, it's basically... But how do you fix the... My point is, and maybe I, maybe I am wrong about that, how do you get it to, to... How do you say to somebody, hey, giant infrastructure corporation, mm -hmm. make the water stop in the slum too, on the way to the five-star hotel? And they'll say, because it's more profitable for me to go directly to the five-star hotel. But here's the, I, I change that thinking. Ho hopefully, but, hopefully, with these water credit programs, by proving that these people are viable customers. Yeah. And the more that you prove that model, the more the utilities start to pay attention and but say, wait a minute, there's this whole model, changing, there's a market here that we're missing. You're talking about changing giant corporate thinking in many ways. <laughs> but but, but uh, look at how quickly that can change and has changed on, on, on any, any number of issues. If they, if they smell a market, Mm -hmm. It'll change quickly. And, and, <laughs> and you're a, building, you're helping to build that market. We're, we're proving it. Water credit is proving and reproving it every day. I mean, there, there's a great example to, to draw on from here with this market. And, and first of all, the, 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 the utility loses money on every gallon of water that they sell to the five-star hotel because the subsidies in the structure are all upside down. You get a subsidy if you have the water connection. That's how the subsidies are delivered. If you're too poor for the water connection, you can't capture the subsidy and you pay the water vendors. But there's this concept in the pharma industry with advanced market commitments that you know, the Gates Foundation and others have come in with. And the whole concept is that there's a huge market out there with these diseases that need to be cured among the world's poor, but the pharmaceutical companies don't see a market because they're too poor to pay. So the whole concept is the Gates Foundation and others guarantee the market so that the drug will get invented and then it goes out. With us, we think there's a potential that that slum is a huge market and we can help drive that advanced market commitment by saying we will guarantee, say, 80% of everybody in that slum will connect and start paying a water bill because we can there's reach a water credit. Right. Yeah. And then the infrastructure can come. It's a concept that we're exploring, but it, there's, there's things that you can do. Again, that's not like coming at it from a technology standpoint. It's coming at it from a market and a system. That's right. And it's I a good discussion. I'm really thirsty, but I feel too guilty to drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the benefits of I living mean, in I the West. I mean, I feel like I'm just looking at this crystal <laughs> goblet <laughs> and a sterling silver thing here with that's the right. water. I'm bathing in this. I mean, it's anyway, go ahead, Usha. I'm sorry. No, I'm just, I mean, I've been wanting this, this for 10 minutes, and I was too embarrassed <laughs> to get it. <laughs> no, no, my point is going to be really weak compared to that now, but um, uh, no, I was just going to say you looked at me and you said big infrastructure corporation. The thing about big infrastructure corporations, nameless big faces finance, corporations, yes, of course, yes. no, no names. Right. Right. They will sell, as you absolutely said, if they see a market, and seeing a market means that they have a place where people f will pay for what they sell. It's as simple as that. The trouble with water is that it's never been valued. Right. It hasn't been priced. Mm -hmm. In my country, um, water is sold for five cents per cubic meter. Think about that doesn't cover, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. The utilities are bankrupt because they can't make you know, ends meet, really. So the whole thing now, today, is really to try to get people to understand that water has a value. It has a value because it's not infinite. And if you can pay for a cell phone, yeah. you can pay for, for well, which a gallon is, which of water. Is, which is so true, Usha, but it's insane what you just said, right? Oh. And we, I mean. It has no value, but I guarantee you, if we don't have it for three or four days, and you got a gallon of it, yeah. we're going to find some value here pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. right. But, you know, there is a market. I think you've heard this several times. It raises the question, um, the notion really is of perceived value. The same people who, buy, who are paying for their cell phone clearly perceive a higher value there than they do currently Why? for the water. And that's got to change, and I think you're absolutely right. It's not just technology. It's innovative business models. It's innovative financing. And at the same time, it's innovative solutions that you can actually use to deliver this water that is there. And as, as you said, Matt, and I pointed out, it's not a case of planet shortage of water. It's how we use that water and how we distribute it that's going to change the game. We're not going to create new masses of water. It's what we're doing with it. We're a little over halfway done. We, got a set, we have a second video, the great opening video. I believe we do have a second video. I mean, the organizers are going to give me the business if I don't uh, call for the video soon. Somebody's probably getting nervous in the back. Um, so we have an, another video for you guys to watch. Very cool. So if we can, let's uh, roll the video and refill our cups in the dark. <laughs>
until everybody has access to clean water and sanitation, I will not go to the bathroom. The toilet strike, it's important, all right? Who's with me? I'm supporting Matt Damon's toilet strike. I'm with you, Matt. We won't go to the bathroom. We won't go to the bathroom. We won't go to the bathroom. Until everyone in the world has access to clean water and sanitation. Right! It's easy for me, actually, because I've never gone to the bathroom in my entire life. I haven't peed or pooped in four days, and I feel great. Are we not supposed to excrete waste at all, or is it just not in the toilet? Yeah, no, I'm not clear on that. I've just been using the kitchen sink. One time I thought I was going to fart, but then it came out as air freshener. My family did move out. Strike! You can buy it in stores. It's the most expensive air freshener in the world. But I just bought this wonderful new air freshener, and the kitchen smells great. Let's get this party started! Join the millions of famous people who've already joined my strike. It smells like a hummingbird singing in here. That's me. Support the strike. Go to strikewithme.org to learn more. <laughs> So there you have it. <laughs> I'm here to enlist your help. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that's obviously where we, we, you know, talking about how, how to reach people in this country, it's difficult because the first hurdle we have to clear is to just explain the problem at all. You know, it, it's, it's uh, you know, we can, we can get clean water quite easily and, and, and we think we should get it incredibly cheaply as well. And that's how we're conditioned to to think, and so, um, so we've, we've, we've started doing some humorous uh, viral videos to try to start to raise awareness about this. But, well, the next panel tonight is the importance of defecation. Good, good. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, we work just, on that know, too. For so, clean colon yeah. health, you're a doctor of endocrinology, <laughs> right? <laughs> Actually, that's, that's a bad video, isn't it, doctor? I, mean, this is I think it's a hilarious video. <laughs> All right, back to the, that was fantastic. Back to the subject, because that's what it takes. I mean, to get the attention, to get the awareness here. Uh, do you feel that, that uh, there is, so they're doing great work on the ground, mm -hmm. microcredits. Do you feel like at some point, or maybe we're getting there, that the larger side, the corporate side, unlike Pepsi and a few others who've been great, Caterpillar you mentioned, uh, are getting there, are, are becoming more aware? They are. I mean, if you talk about the corporates like Pepsi, Mahmoud was talking about this, for them it's a question of um, license to operate in many of the environments in which they operate. They have plants in places which don't have enough water. What they find is that if they are using the water, their plant sometimes gets shut down. So it's a question of license to operate. Um, so I think there is an increasing interest in the whole issue of getting involved in the water sector, whether it's a corporate or whether it is some levels of government, but here's the issue from my perspective. We have to get the politicians involved in countries, especially in the kind of countries that I come from, that it is very, very important to put the right laws and regulations in place so people can get water. Right now, politicians are the ones, especially sometimes in countries like mine, that offer up free water. There's no such thing as free water. Water costs something. And so we have to get many more people into the game and into understanding that water is a important and finite resource that we have to protect for the future. It's amazing though, to, not to harp on the point, but I mean, I think we all in this room, everybody in the world understands the value, the real value of water. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not a hard subject. I don't understand why there's been, Gary, why did no, it take, it why are we even at this <laughs> freaking point? There's this incredible downward spiral of a cycle around water supply in developing countries. And it, it, res it's, it chases itself, right? So on the one hand, you have water priced at a price so low that you cannot even recover the operation and maintenance cost often, let alone the capital expenditure that goes with that. And people are not willing to pay a higher rate because they have a lousy water service. You get that reinforced by when you travel to developing countries, when you kind of conjure the city image in your mind, you can picture water tanks right, on the roof of every building that you see. Sometimes they're these black syntax tanks, sometimes they're concrete boxes. Every one of those tanks has a pump attached to it. Nobody gets water 24-7 in these cities. So when the water comes on, that house pumps and pumps, fills their tank, and then they simulate 24-7 service. So that's the way the system works right now. So imagine if you could harness all of the capital that went into every one of those tanks, every one of those pumps, and turn it back into a functioning infrastructure system, problem solved. On the flip side, who wants to pay a higher water bill when they've already invested in all that infrastructure? 
because the system is working pretty good for them because they had enough to buy the pump and buy the tank. And so you almost have a disincentive for them to want to pay, pay a higher water fee. So I'm, I'm just painting the picture of the problem here, right? The solution is pretty complex, but basically the whole pricing of water, water as a resource, water meeting human needs is one of the dis most distorted markets in the world. And Absolutely. it's gonna take a lot to untangle that web. And for me being in this, you know, my whole life, what I keep coming back to is you've got to start at the bottom with that person. You've got to work with the system that exists. And if you can do something to tilt that system in the favor mm -hmm. of the poor, that's what we're going to be doing. And we keep doing that until we run into the next roadblock, like I said, and then we clear that roadblock. Are there other places where it's been, you said 17 countries, obviously you want to grow that. Are there places where it's been harder? <laughs> more difficult than other places? What are some of the roadblocks you guys have faced? Because here's the sad reality. There are people in charge often who don't necessarily benefit from people gaining the kind of economic and personal freedom that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Some pretty bad places out there. How do you identify where to go and, and what if some of the roadblocks you face been? Mm. Well, I think one of the biggest places we are right now is India. And India is a great market because there's so many microfinance institutions uh, and there's, you know, there's literally, uh, you know, 100 million people without access to improved water. And so that's, that's a, a huge market for us. And, you know, uh, I think Matt was mentioning a little bit earlier when we talked to our microfinance partners there, their biggest bottleneck is access to capital right now, affordable capital. They're having to pay about 15 percent to source capital. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is to create this debt fund. Uh, that will allow us to raise social impact investor capital here, deliver it to our microfinance partners at a much lower rate so that they can drive the cost down to the end borrower. So our targeted financial return is 2% to the impact investors, and then we can drive the cost of capital down to our partners, thereby matching up people here with big hearts and big wallets through an investment vehicle that allows the poor at the center of this problem to start climbing out of poverty with those small loans. But in the most efficient way possible, in the sense that the, 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 you know, your startup costs are the, are the biggest part of it at the beginning, and then you know, as you just keep adding people to the loan program, you know, as it matures, that cost, a philanthropic cost per person yeah. just keeps going down and you down. You talked down. about, I think it was $25 a person down to six or seven with the scale. It's where we are now, right? How, how much growth do you need to get to that level, where it becomes that much more affordable? How big? What's the scale ratio, I guess, is what I'm trying to ask here. Is it 10 people? Is it a million people? Is it 1,000 people? How, how, well, f how many, for, sorry, how many people does it take to drive it all the way down to six or seven? Yeah. Uh, have to be. Well, we're at, we've, re we've reached now uh, about a million and a half people with these programs. Um, and with the most mature ones, I mean, how, you know, how many would you say, Gary? I mean, well, the one with the PepsiCo Foundation is 800,000 people we're going to be reaching with that, and that's the most mature one, and it's, it's well down below $7 per person now. Already, so, though. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 And I think as, as we roll out now, you know, with, with Caterpillar in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Peru, those are going to be up more at that kind of $24 to $36 range at the until start, you start right. seeing more cycles of the loan, and those are amortized right. over those startup costs. So the return on investment is great. Yeah, I mean, in your first pro I mean, you've done when you've gotten that kind of efficiency and down to six or seven bucks. Well, it's to a add to that, our investment. actual reach number, and we set ourselves a goal to reach three million. Yeah, we got three million access to three million two to three years ahead of schedule. Now, in partnership with both the Columbia uh, Water Institute and water.org, we said we'll reach another three million. So we're actually targeting already six million within the next two or three years. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to scale this, it tells you there's a demand, there's capability, and there are resources available to do this. Mm -hmm. Now the question is exactly what was being said. How do you innovate to this? Because six million sounds great. Mm -hmm. The real opportunity is how do you get to 600 million? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I think exactly. what we have to really set ourselves as the goals of how do we aspire to that half a billion to a billion and bring lots of players to the table. This is not going to take a company or one NGO. It's going to take governments, it's going to take academia, and it's going to take industry working together at the same table saying, we're going to solve this. But let me just add one thing. Hunger has got a lot more attention than water. Ironically, hunger and water are 
tightly interrelated. The same individuals that have micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies, often are as a result, not because they don't have enough food, because they have gut infestations, they have bacterial infections, yep. that are draining the nutrients that we're actually providing them through charitable or other ways, and we, somehow we've sort of separated these two issues out. And for me, one of the important things is, how do we bring this together and say, you cannot solve hunger without water, and you cannot solve the water issue without solving the hunger issue. Bring it together. There are lots of players then that can actually take this to another level. Well, what somebody should do is create a corporation that is halfway good at selling beverages and the other half at salty snacks. We call that power <laughs> of love. Those things together, <laughs> that would solve the problem. You've just solved both problems. Yeah, we call but that you power. Know of any companies like this? We call that power of one. <laughs> it's the power of one, and you've got a label for it. But I think the point, all humor aside, it wasn't even that funny. Uh, that we have to make a point of what I was trying to get at, and I'm lobbing you a softball which is, it's good business. Absolutely. It makes money. It's not just, let's do this because it's the right thing to do, because unfortunately that is not always the incentive people need. But you need viable businesses to be sustaining this. At the end of the day, healthy businesses exist in healthy communities. Mm -hmm. And you create a healthy community, you get a healthy business. Mm -hmm. And those two together create a healthy country. And that's what's Takes needed both. for economic development, really. You know, and there's also, I feel like that'd be a great place to stop, but we still have 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well said, Usha, I can't. Uh, but there's also, um, I don't know who would be the best, probably for you to talk about this, which is, uh, which is risk, global risk, okay? Uh, for risk of hunger, risk of thirst, risk of 980,000 preventable deaths a year from not just diarrhea, but from other intestinal infections, uh, my mood like you were talking about, uh, which is risk for business viability. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, this is, this is, there may be some CEOs in here and thinking, why do I care? Well, because your business may be at risk, correct? So, yes. So, there, as a business, you have several types of risk. One, as I said, one is a license to operate, and that's a community based risk. You need to make sure that you're, you have a healthy and supplied community so that you, they don't turn against you when you're trying to. So, about a run social your contract, a social, a social license. Contract. The other risk is supply chain risk. I'm sure Mahmoud can talk about that forever. Supply chains need water, and if, if the companies don't deal with the water issue, then their supply chains get closed down and they don't get products to the market. So there's various levels of risk as a corporation that you face if you don't deal with the issue of water. I, I'm not even talking about financial risk of you know making projections of your company with analysts and whatnot that don't take into account water availability or water use in your operations. Nobody even thinks about that. I, can, I, I can honestly say I've been doing this a long time now. I've been on way too many conference calls. I, I, I can't remember any company talking about water as a risk in, their, in an earnings call. Mm. Now I'm going to bring it up on every freaking call I'm on. Well, no, it's interesting yeah, because but, <laughs> the, the, the World Economic Forum just published yeah, I was just gonna say. its poll of, of its members. Water access, water scarcity, water resources came out as number three yeah. of, of the, the, the threats seen as by CEOs. So they're aware, Gary. They're aware, yeah. And, and then they're starting to take action. I mean, the water footprint of, of corporations, uh, you know, PepsiCo has been in the lead on this, but there's been lots of people who have followed in terms of kind of tightening up those, those uh, water uses within the gates of their plants. Uh, it's getting a lot more play, but a lot more needs to be done. And I think it's, I think one of the things that's a challenge sometimes with these things is like being at a level that, do, that gives people no hope for taking action. So I, if we could just pivot just a little bit, because some people are probably wondering, you know, what can I do about this, right? How can, how can they join in? And I think it is so complex, so big, it is all hands on deck, right? It's the World Bank. Mm -hmm. It's like what PepsiCo's doing. It's like what we're doing. I think uh, it's also about looking at new ways to bring capital into it, whether that be commercial capital through different players, whether it be philanthropic capital to come in to help correct some of the market failures, or whether it be the social impact capital. So people in this room can get involved even in that way with philanthropic capital. It's not just water.org. I mean, there's other great organizations tackling this. Water for People, Safe Water Network. They're out there. They're doing this as well. And to, to have people come on board with them and with us, to come on board with philanthropic capital, and as in quarter three, we launched the debt fund. Mm -hmm. People will actually be able to bring in social impact capital and get a financial return as well as helping the poor get water. There's just, it, it takes a, you know, a multitude of different strands of solutions to, to fight the problem. That's how I wanted to end it, was talk about the loan program. Uh, coming out fall, 
Uh, third quarter, yeah, yeah, uh, will be this opportunity to, uh, you know, social impact investing of, um, you know, putting this money into this system that's been proven to work and, um, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and we have a targeted 2% return. Um, to kind of answer that question that we were, that, that these MFIs posed to us about, you know, um, you know, what can we do to get, you know, access to affordable capital? Because um, it turns out it's really, uh, it's expensive to be poor. You know, we can all go out and get a loan, uh, you know, tonight. Um, whereas these, these folks, the very poorest of the poor, are paying 22 or 24 percent and are happy to do it because they're so desperate for these solutions. Um, and, they're, and they're doing it at 98 or 99 percent. Um, so, so, yeah, we'll be launching that in uh, the third quarter of this year. And uh, um, I'm in it. Steven's in it. We're all... You're, you're, you're welcome to join us. And how can, well, how, how can they participate once this thing rolls out? How can they participate now? Uh, well, to participate now, you can go to our website, to water.org, um, or you can come on up and talk to Gary and me right now. We're here. <laughs> and hey. we already have three million committed for the debt fund, by <laughs> the way. That's right, yes. So, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Three million, and again, uh, I know Stephen had to leave it a million from him tonight. Um, well, hopefully we did something tonight to raise more of the awareness. Oh, I know we have a lot of heavy hitters in this room. You guys are all, if you're at the Milken Conference, it means you're, you're, you're probably doing some work or you've got some visibility in your organization. I think this is an issue that, that needs to have awareness raised on it. So you've heard all the facts, you've heard some of the scary statistics, and, and they are. Um, it's literally a life or death issue. And I know that everybody on this panel uh, doing the best they can to, to help solve the problem. So we hope you do as well. And I want to thank Gary, Usha, Matt, and Mahmoud. Thank you all for an excellent panel.